Hello and welcome to a new video in the topic of measure theory. First let me thank all the nice people that support this channel on Steady. And today's topic is Lebesgue Steltjes measures. It sounds like something different than a normal measure, but it's not. It's just a way to construct an ordinary measure. And in this way we can start, we will now construct a measure. The only thing we need here is a monotonically increasing function defined on the real number line. And when I say monotonically increasing, I mean non-decreasing. In other words, a constant function is also monotonically increasing. The best way to see that is of course to draw a short graph of such a function. So maybe the function is first increasing here then it is constant and maybe then we have a jump point at this point so no value here the value is here then still constant and maybe after this it's still increasing and then comes the next jump point so here is the point and then it goes to an increasing function till here and then maybe it's constant after that Okay, so this is a typical example of a graph of a monotonically increasing function. In particular, it's allowed that the function is constant at some parts. And there could be also points where the function is non-continuous, so where we have jumps. But of course, the jumps has to go upwards. Now, with the help of such a function, we want to measure the length of intervals. First I want to calculate intervals of the form AB, where A is included but B is excluded. For better visualization I can put that here in the picture. So here is A and there is our B. Obviously the normal notion of the length would be just B minus A. But here I want that F as a function scales the length of this interval. This means that the length should be longer where the increase of the function is stronger. Therefore we have to look what the function does with the interval. So we look at the image of the interval under the function f. In the picture this would roughly look like this. So we have a point fb here and f of a here. Scaling the length of this interval with the function f now just means we look at the y-axis here, which means the length of this interval, which is just f of b minus f of a. Okay, now I hope you immediately recognized a mistake here. You see, b is not a point in our interval. Therefore it would be wrong to use this point, so the image of B, we should rather use this point here. This one is the correct point that describes the right hand bound of the image of AB. Therefore on the y axis we also have this point here, the important one, and I would call it FB- in a short notation. Therefore I would also include the point here on the right for calculating the length of the interval. Well, now you should see we have the same problem here, we have the same problem on the left hand side with the point A. You see A is included in our interval and therefore we should include this full jump in our calculation of the length of this interval. On the right hand side we ignored the full jump because B was not in the interval, but now A is in the interval and therefore we should add the jump to our calculation. You see this immediately, if we change this point maybe to the middle here, then we would change the whole calculation of the length, but we wouldn't change the total jump. Hence the only meaningful way to choose a point here would be to choose the point, the value at the bottom here. And as before, I also would call this in short by F A minus. And then we include the minus sign here as well. Now this thing is now our new notion of a length of an interval. 
And of course, I should give it a name and we call it mu with index f of this interval. And to be more precise, I also add the definition of our fb minus or fa minus. As you can see, this is nothing else than a left limit. So we get closer and closer coming from the left. Therefore, we can write this as an epsilon that goes to zero plus, which means it's an epsilon greater than zero that goes to zero. And then we subtract it from A. And then you see, we get back the points we have seen in our drawing here. And at this point, you are allowed to ask what happens if I come from the right hand side instead of the left hand side. And then what you get is an alternative way to write this down. So we have FB plus minus FA plus, where the plus now means the right hand limit. Now, if you go back to our graph, then you see now we describe another interval not this one, because now we ignore this jump, but we add this jump on the right. This means that we exactly change the boundaries here. Now we measure an interval where A is not included, but B is. Hence, if you want to work with these intervals, then you have to consider the right hand limit. I personally want to work with these intervals and therefore we don't need the alternative here. Nevertheless, it's very important to note that if you look at the points where the function f is not continuous, then it does not matter at all where the value of the function at this point is. It only matters what the limit from the left hand side is and what the limit from the right hand side is. Because these two points describe how large the jump is. Okay. As said before, I want to work with these intervals here because we know from another video that they form a so-called semi-ring. This is what I explained to you in the video about Kara Theodore's extension theorem. And now we can apply this theorem to conclude that we can extend this definition to a measure defined on the full Borel sigma algebra of R. This means there is exactly one measure defined on BR to zero infinity with the property that we have here. So maybe let's call this property here star and then I can write star here. Now it's useful to call this uniquely given measure again by mu f. And if we construct a measure in this way, we call it a Lebesgue-Steltjes measure. And to be more concrete, you call it the Lebesgue-Steltjes measure for the function f. Here you recognize how strong Kara Theodore's extension theorem really is. You only have to define the measure for the intervals and then you get exactly one measure for all the well sets out. Okay, now you know how this construction works and I would suggest that we now look at examples. An example means of course we choose a monotonically increasing function capital F and then we look what is the associated Lebesgue-Steltjes measure. Okay, maybe the easiest example is the Lebesgue measure itself. For this we choose simply the identity, so the function fx equals to x then we don't change the normal measuring of lengths of intervals. So we get out B minus A as before. Hence we get out our ordinary Lebesgue measure. Another example of a very easy monotonically increasing function would be a constant function. So let's choose fx is equal to one everywhere. Obviously in this case, Measuring the length of intervals is very boring because we subtract right from left, so we have here everywhere zero. Hence, this is not so surprising, we get out our zero measure. Okay, maybe more interesting would be the case where we have two values for the function. So, 
constant function with the exception of one jump. For example, we could choose zero if x is less than zero and one if x is greater or equal than zero. And please remember, it does not matter where the equality sign is here. The measure just doesn't care about this. The measure can't see this point there. Now, obviously, we have the same result as before for all intervals that lie completely to the left of zero or completely to the right of zero. Now we get out again the measure zero. Hence, the interesting cases would be where zero is inside the interval. For example, let's look at the interval minus epsilon till epsilon. Of course, where epsilon is a positive number. Now, what do we get? Yeah, on the right hand side, we have one. On the left, we have zero. So we have one minus zero. So we get out one. And please note, this holds for all epsilon. We already know a measure that does this. And this is the Dirac measure at zero. Now, by the uniqueness result, we know that the extension has to be this Dirac measure. So you see, we can use this strong result very often. Now, for the end of the video, let's look at a very general example. Therefore, let's choose a general monotonically increasing function f. But in addition, it should also be continuously differentiable. Both things together now means that the derivative is continuous and also has values in a non-negative numbers. On the other hand, f itself is of course continuous, therefore there are no jumps. This means that we don't have the problem with the left hand limit and the right hand limit from before. For this continuous function we can just use the values of the function. This means the length of the interval is nothing more than fb minus fa. Now, if you learn calculus, you should immediately recognize this one here. Namely, here you can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus, which tells you this is the integral of the derivative of f dx, where the f just denotes the normal Lebesgue measure here. Okay, and this is all we need, because you would believe me that we can define a new measure. So for each Borel set A, we define the measure as this integral. Yeah, so we send the Borel set to this number here. This defines us a measure on the Borel sigma algebra of R. And now we apply the uniqueness result of Cavatier-Theodori's extension theorem. And then we get out that our measure mu f looks exactly like this one. We know it looks like this for all intervals and therefore it should also look like this for each Borel set. Okay, here you see a very general result for such lebesgue celsius measures. And this part here in the integral is then often called a density function. However, that's a thing we could discuss in another video later. Here I really hope you learned something today and that you can apply these results in other applications. If you see a monotonically increasing function, now you can construct the Lebesgue Studious measure for this function. Well, thank you for listening and see you next time. Bye!